to ContraCast. My name is Kat Boyd. I'm joined with my lovely co-host, David Jameson. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm um, recovering from uh, one of my first post-lockdown kind of minor colds. Um, and it occurred to me that I don't think I've had one of those for basically since, since lockdowns started. I don't think I've had a serious single cold. Um, I've not been on public transport, which is I think we usually get them. So yeah, I'm I'm bouncing back from uh, my first kind of cold-like uh, uh, symptoms. Nature's healing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Nature's healing. You're getting sick. I'm the same. Like I've not been ex- having not been exposed to germs for so long. I feel like I'm going to just get every cold, ear infection, all that sort of stuff. I've already got so a sore ear. And now you've got a sore ear after we were hanging out and I presented you with your wonderful birthday portrait. I'll have, to, I'll have to bring this on one of these episodes. If, if you follow me on social media, you've probably seen it, but it is a spectacular piece of art based <laughs> on a, a photo of me standing at this enormous golden eagle lectern wielding a copy of the Bible. And Kat has transformed this into, uh, you know, an eternal classic uh, of of portraiture um I'm, I'm one of these people i'm not terribly into modern art i try i try to get into it because i feel like a total stick in the mud but i think if i was an artist I'd, I'd want to do like painting or sculpture or something like that i wouldn't do you know what i mean i think we should just go back to painting that's what i'm saying i mean oh, let, let's not get into this conversation this could be that could be a whole episode i remember yeah. one of the um, first kind of big arguments I got into at work when I worked in the job centre there was like um, maybe like a staff magazine or something and someone wrote an article about how modern art was just really stupid and rubbish and I wrote this defence of modern art from an anti-capitalist perspective um, and then actually that's kind of how me and James started talking like James Foley who is who I'm now going to marry and <laughs> he bought me a book about how the CIA um, used modern art and um, to further the American agenda like um yeah so I mean that's a whole that's a whole episode's worth of so. that sounds like a, that sounds like a great conversation is this a book that alleges that like socialist realism is actually the true virtuous art <laughs> and and all this western liberalism is a load of degenerate capitalist filth a lot of stuff on it but it's basically about how abstract expressionism like in the 40s was used like to further like the american ideology of individualism and um, through throughout the period of the cold war like that this was like the true expression of what it means to be human like and there's a lot there is there is evidence I mean this isn't conspiratorial stuff there is evidence about like where funds came from for like big art projects and art galleries yada yada um I mean it it sounds like there was a an intense intellectual environment in the uh, civil service magazine (laughs) 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 some serious debates going on actually I, I can't quite remember how it all happened Mm. Um, I remember reading it and being like, oh, I'm just going to like do all this pattern about Picasso and African art and yeah. Um, yeah, so the book that I'm talking about is um, by Serge Gilbot and it's called How New York Stole the Idea of Modern Art. Um, I do recommend it. It's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great eye opener into like the, the world of like avant-garde art how the left's cultural figures of like writers and artists were captured and co-opted by politicians um, to further their agenda something which I mean I think is uh, very topical today. I know we're not we're not delving into this but I do want to bring this up because I saw it in a tweet recently and I think it's a really good question right and the, the tweet was, because, I mean, you can argue that, that it was CIA-backed and liquid modernity and all this kind of stuff. But, of course, it's the case that you can have reactionary art that's good art, right? And this tweet was asking, what is your favourite piece of reactionary art? And I'm sure the correct answer is something like, like 
Wagner or Ezra Pound or something like that, right? But my favorite recent example is the film Whiplash. Have you ever seen that? This, that's about the drummers. Ah, that's 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 reactionary art, definitely. Um, because the, the whole the whole I'm not really ruining anything for you, but the whole ethos of it is like nihilistic self-destructive devotion to art should triumph over like HR concerns right if you uh if honestly if you go back and watch the film it's this sort of like triumph of the will sort of attitude which is deeply unfashionable especially at the time when that film came out it was basically like uh I mean the argument becomes like everyone should drive themselves on to achieve some sort of artistic ideal even if it kills you even if it destroys your psychology you know what I mean it's a very it's a very anti-safe spaces sort of film um, and it's like, but at the same time, it's a very kind of like rugged individualist celebration, very kind of machismo uh, and all that kind of stuff. So it's very out of step with current, current cultural production, but it's a great film. Right? It's really good. I mean, I haven't seen, I think I've like, you know, flicked past it on some streaming site. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that you've got to be really, I don't like the culture of kind of avoiding problematic art and um, mm. I, I think that it's really censorious and then the, the, I do like Tracy Emin okay I'm just gonna say it. of course I do like and um, I think that that's probably like a generational thing mm. um, and I know that like a lot of her politics and her art could be deemed reactionary, individualistic. But I think that it's important that we have these types of figures who are prepared to delve into the, the darkest parts of what it means to be human and be able to like bring something out of that. I, I mean, I, my sort of feeling with art in general is, I mean, this is, I'm very uneducated in all these debates, but my general feeling is that, uh, you know, in the, in the 20th century, this idea triumphed among intellectuals that everything that was intuitive and emotional and felt was somehow more authentic than the life of the mind. It's more authentic than rationality or science or whatever. And there was an, an ending suspicion of these, of these things. And art tends to be the realm of expression. It tends to be the realm of the intuitive and the felt and, and so on, not always, but typically. Um, and so I see it as potentially like a, a rich area for reaction in general. Uh, and very often I find things that I politically disagree with to be the most interesting art for that reason. So the classic examples like the, the shift in the Reformation was from an essentially visual culture in Catholicism and a felt culture and an emotional culture into a textual, critical sort of culture. Um, but Catholic art of that period is superior to my mind to any of the art that emerged from uh, the Reformation. So simply for that reason, the Catholic Church needed to have like an emotional engagement with its congregation, who were largely illiterate and were not being called upon to, to engage in a, in a criticism of, of scripture or tradition or, uh, or whatever. Um, and in, instead of that, the culture was very much one of ritual, one of paintings, one of architecture, you know, the great cathedrals of Europe uh, and so on. Now you could broadly say that's reactionary, but it created real beauty. You know, I mean, much of European civilization's most uh, beautiful artistic works. I think it's important to expose ourselves to these types of ideas and to experience like the the way that you know reactionary art can still move us and what that tells us about ourselves. Yeah, and it's sometimes easier to do it with uh, an artist who's you know in the distant past, well, not distant past, but someone who's dead, right, and widely acclaimed. I mean, Dostoevsky is a reactionary, mm. but, but few would deny that he's probably. He's perhaps the most important writer of the uh, uh, of, of of modernity, basically. And uh, but you know, w without a doubt, I mean, he was someone who defected from 
from liberalism to you know uh, Christian orthodoxy and a defence of the social order on that on that basis. And it's in everything he writes. It's unavoidable, you know. Um, I was reading um, Crime and Punishment recently, and it's incredible just how political it is, what a diatribe it is against uh, liberalism, against the emerging liberal attitudes in Russia and in, in Europe at, at the time. Um, and it even seems to sort of, it sort of preempts argues about kind of like Nietzsche and stuff like that. But he he sees, he, he would even see like radical right wing thinkers like that as almost an attack from the left on the Orthodox church. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's seriously uh, reactionary work. Um, and I hope you don't have people going around saying, don't take Dostoevsky seriously, because you can, you can understand a lot about the spirit even of our times by reading it and the, and the psychological pressures of society and, um, and the dilemmas of modern society and the ways in which people can be appealed to and spoken to on quite a deep kind of you know, psychological level. I think it's probably foolish to not understand that, you know, to not understand that type of culture. Anyway. Yeah, so that's it. We'll have to return to this to a full, full, full episode. We've gone way off piece <laughs> uh, with that, uh, that conversation. Uh, so, what was on our, our agenda today? Glasgow, or well, this, like, the fact that, like, the entire population of Glasgow are being effectively fucking gaslit by the council? Yeah, so speaking of reactionary works of literature. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's an article in the Sunday Herald, I think, uh, well-informed as usual, where Susan Aitken outlines her plan for the future of Glasgow, uh, cash-strapped Glasgow, where uh, services are being cut to bits. Um, well, in a way allegedly, allegedly being cut. Mm. This is the problem with the whole thing, is that, like, Susan Aitken was on Twitter last week insisting that no venue in Glasgow is earmarked for closure. I saw that. The this. service is going to be cut. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll see how true that is. But you're absolutely right in the sense that, like, was a time when if you extracted a, a, a statement like that from a politician, you would have thought, well, we've got the bang to rights now. Um, but no, not necessarily. Uh, we'll, 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 have to, we'll have to wait and see in that regard. But the, the vision for the future of the city leading up to and after COP26 uh, COP is um, it basically walks on two legs. It seems to be massive private investment into infrastructure and services on the pretense that these are green in, you know, uh, developments and also a greater civic ethos uh, among the Glaswegian public uh, in two senses. One, well, I mean, the, 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 some of the worst parts of this article, she's quoted as basically saying, it's not the council that letters. This has become a famous one. It's not the council that letters, it's the public that's littering, right? So that's why we've got a letter problem. It's that. It's not that we've cut 100 jobs and, uh, uh, you know, like 100 uh, uh, cleaners and, and, and ben, ben men and refuse workers. It can't be that. It can't be that you've cut down massively on the number of uh, bin pickups and all this kind of stuff right around the city I can't remember a time and I know it's it's this kind of localism thing like maybe I'm just becoming really middle-aged and like uh, bins concern me in a major way but I can't remember a time when there was such consternation about the pigsty that the city is becoming um, add to that the city centre is a total mess like it, it really is uh, uh, sort of degraded by this point but so there's that and then basically the other argument seems to be that oh, this famous one that I remember Michael Gove saying I mean there's so much from the kind of Cameron era uh, conservative party that's been reproduced uh, in in the modern SNP um, this uh, same argument of Gove but it's like oh we live in we live in an era of the internet why do we have libraries so she's saying so you can keep your lovely old library buildings or we could have a brand new facility. Of course, the suspicion is that once you start closing these libraries, which as you say a few days ago, Susan Aiken said they weren't closing, right? Once you close these libraries, they won't get re replaced with a new, brand new service, state of the art. That, if, if you don't have the money to keep open 
and these aren't like the the library i mean what there's a library down the road from me that's one of the ones that's threatened it's a simple facility it has a handful of staff it's not a big library it's it's a community library so there's lots of books for kids there's lots of general interest there's a few computers that you can get on the internet with it's a simple service the idea that we need to cut that because we don't have the money and then we're going to replace it with some sort of space aged digi space you know uh that's all uh glass and steel and there'll be some state of the art i don't know robots handing you books are you know uh, yeah, service for sure <laughs> yeah exactly right it's nonsense it's total nonsense but it's just i mean it just reinforces to me that you know that thing that people are saying that was said in that um book uh, uh the end of the end of history that is it will be the center left which holds on to neoliberalism the longest um sheer lack of ideas and for this attitude that everything that's new is dangerous do you know what i mean so <laughs> new departure departures in macroeconomics um where you know there's all the state spending and so on state-led investment that must be dangerous because it's new and it's being done by the right. And the reason it's being done by the right is that it's the right in power, you know, and for just sheer lack of alternatives. And because the SNP seems to be wedded to big business in a completely, in like a one way relationship, you know what I mean? The Tories don't have that. The Tories have a type of relationship with British capitalism where they can say, no, you're going to do this now. Right. You know, it's a complex relationship between the centre left and big business. It's not a complex relationship. Big business seems to say jump, mm. and parties like the SNP say how high, like, and that's how we're, we're we've got into this ridiculous situation. Everyone, do you remember, you know, a couple of years ago, everyone was like, Scotland's way out ahead the rest of the world in its innovations and its social democracy and all this stuff. Total rot, and we're now very obviously behind all the curves. Scotland is behind London. There's no question. Like we're trailing behind, uh, you know, the Bidens and the Johnsons and and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, it's a mess. I, I, I mean, the stuff for Glasgow, I think that is really concerning is just this um, insistence that like private finance will be driving any type of green changes within the city council and um, like all of those green projects are going to require massive investment from private industry we will require private capital i mean so what was the point of the scottish national investment bank if not this like major infrastructure projects like they're talking about like glasgow like me it's a metro system like why is that like and i'm not talking about like letting glasgow city council off the hook but the, I mean, this is like, uh, th this is fucking new labor. This is new labor chat. This is PFI. This is like the same type of economics that got Glasgow City Council and Scotland into a giant fucking hole in the first place. I, I agree. And it, and it really, it shows you the binds that I think the left is in over the environmental question, because when it comes to how you organize a so-called, you know, green industry, green investment, green development, who's going to be doing that? And where's the money coming from and all this kind of stuff? Um, I, you know, the, look, capitalism is going to adapt to the situation, it is going to exploit uh, these new green industries, it is going to utilize these arguments and the sense of urgency around the question for new rounds of uh, accumulation. That, yeah. That's a thing thing that's going to happen and if we're not careful in very short order the entire um the entire horizon of this issue will be completely colonized by big capital i'm not convinced at this point that that all hasn't already happened there's a really interesting um confrontation uh, between nicholas sturgeon and some uh, climate activists uh and it was over um, this new oil field that, you know, um, the, you know, these oil companies want to open in the North Sea. Now, I don't know if these activists were with a group called, um, I think it's called Green New Deal Rising or something like that. But I saw, but I got, I came across this clip from their Twitter account, right? And this is a group that's been launched um, 
uh, in recent days uh, in the run-up to COP26. Now, I went in and, and looked at the funding for Green New Deal Rising, uh, and I'm not surprised all to see this. this. This is how NGOs work, but it's funded by like the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, it's funded by the Oak Foundation, and all these sorts of groups and initiatives. So what you are actually witnessing, who, who are heavily, heavily invested in these emerging green technologies and, and green industries and so on, um, and who diverged years ago, I mean, the Rockefeller Fund moved into um, green energy in 2014. Now, the, their, their public expression of this was that it was, you know, this is about we need to save civilization, all this kind of stuff. That's not how these big funds work, right? They're making investments for return. And they're also driving political initiatives to move public policy away from fossil fuels, right? Which I obviously know is essential, right? So I'm not saying um, that I take no side between these protesters and, and Nicola Sturge and their right to raise those concerns with Sturgeon. I mean, the SNP's position on big oil is uh, hypocritical uh, to a T. Um, but we're in serious danger of entering into a rivalry between blocks of capital, and they will decide between them uh, what these new emerging industries and, and forms of development will look like. We're already quite a long way down that path, and that's my worry about COP26 as well, is that it's just going to be a meeting ground for this battle between different sections of capital over the, over the future of the economy. And that's a really dangerous situation to be in because there's a real prospect, as we've seen in several social movements, of people ultimately rejecting the quote unquote green agenda, right? On the basis that they don't think it's doing anything for them. You know, that's, that would be, that's a disastrous development. Um, and it raises a lot of questions for the uh, the Scottish Greens, I think, as well, uh, in terms yeah. of... So in the last few days, obviously, we've seen... Uh, it, see, it looks like talks are nearing their end. Uh, I don't know what the procedure is from this point. I assume this goes to the Green Party membership. Yeah, I Is that an naive assumption? Yeah, my understanding is that for the coalition to work, it has to be endorsed by a membership vote. I don't really know the internal workings of the Greens, um, I mean, beyond Andy Whiteman's uh, recent blog post. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it has to be endorsed in some fashion by, by the membership. And um, I think it, I mean, you've got to remember like the Greens in Glasgow City Council, there's lots of like, there's various information about like how long the opposition parties have known about certain proposals and there's accusations that groups are making these groups are making capital out of things that they've already been aware about for a number of months and um, so yeah I mean I just uh, the whole thing is a mess and it, I think it's a bit of a beamer for Glasgow generally and um, yeah I mean, I hate local politics. You know that. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's it's like it's a total slap for this entire self-image, yeah. or not just Scotland, but Glasgow is this uh, the success of the the world's first post-industrial city. It's sometimes called. I don't know how true that is, um, but this image of you know Glasgow risen from the ashes. What a cool place. I mean. That message must be getting somewhere because the city's filling up with um, like folk from like London and Seattle and stuff, right? So somewhere someone has had there's this great bohemian place called Glasgow. Uh, it's a bra we say, and uh, but it, yeah, it's embarrassing that uh, this is the level of political discourse in what is traditionally the country's. You know, it's the largest city in the country, and it's traditionally this sort of bastion of of left-wing uh, politics and opinion and so on. And we've got this utterly regressive blueprint for the future of the city. And um, I mean, there is a really embarrassing thing in the, uh, in the west of the city, right? So this is, this is like the worst thing I've fucking seen in a long time. There is a sign up, to, no, two signs in fact, at the Botanic Gardens in Glasgow. 
and they are big pink signs. I think maybe they're sponsored by Glasgow Life. I mean, don't fucking sue me if they're not. Um, big pink signs in the same font as that awful people make Glasgow sign. And it says, be a tidy Ouija, pick up your litter. And every time I see it, I want to be fucking sick. Oh. Like, sorry, but that, like, who the fuck says Ouija? Apart from, you know, settlers to the fucking city. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, so yeah, patronizing. You pick up your litter. Oh, man. Uh, like, that's in the, that needs to go in room 101 with the Trump is a jobby sign. Oh, or yeah. Is a pure fanny. Oh, oh, oh the... it. It makes me fucking <laughs> Oh, I know. See, as soon as that went up, that Boris is a pure fanny thing, I was like, the person who's done that is posh, right? And then it was confirmed to me when one appeared in Latin recently. Like, a version of that appeared in Latin, and it looks like it's in the same hand and stuff. And like, well, there we go. Do you know what I mean? I hate all that cosplaying. Do you know what I mean? If you don't go around saying such and such is a pure fanny, right, then, you know what I mean? Don't do it. Um, no, but yeah, but this is this is the other thing about that about um, Susan Aitken's diatribe is that um, I mean she really does talk about the, the the citizens of the city like their children, like their small children, and the basic argument is this classic Thatcherite right, one of the problem with the state taking responsibility for everything is that people lose a sense of responsibility. Do you know what I mean? They forget what the value of things are because they don't need to make the hard choices. Yeah. Um, and that, but this has always been a really effective tool in the yeah. arsenal of neoliberalism. And do you remember when David Cameron used to used to say, well, the problem with the NHS is the public doesn't have enough control over it, right? So we had this scheme basically to, you know, put it up to vote among people, you know, uh, should we should we fund this treatment or that and all this kind of stuff, right? I totally hate all that stuff. And this is this is where this direct democracy stuff can just be really yeah, it's, but it's that thing that like the, I mean the phrase is used in a very different context and um, that phrase Neil Davidson used um, about devolution of the acts mm. um, you know in relation to uh, like extended devolution to Scotland and the, the context of like an ideology where like you still have austerity is like an extension of that like what a lot of uh, participatory budgeting direct democracy in reality means is that you place the burden on citizens in communities to decide what they're going to cut. Like not how the not how the money's spent, <laughs> not how like you know services are directed and used, like nothing actually fucking useful or democratic. But instead, like what cuts do you want to make? I mean, I think that's sick. I think that, that is genuinely like a really sick and cruel thing to do. I mean, I remember this argument like um, as a as a kid about um, about council houses and the council house sell off and how you know oh when people you know have bought their home they now they look after it more you know they they look after it better. I'm sorry, but what fucking planet do these people live on? Right. The, the, the destruction and dispersal of communities, surprising enough, enough, didn't lead to a society of greater, like, oh. you know, sense of responsibility. And, you know, I mean, like, it led to an atomized. Then community. what happened was, like, a lot of those people who bought their council houses, who were of a particular age group, then had to fucking sell them back to pay for their care costs when they went into nursing homes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like the whole thing's a swizz. The whole thing's yeah. a swizz. Um, and it just, I have a real beer in my bonnet about the direct democracy and participatory budgeting. Um, it's like, a, yeah, it's like Porto Alegre gone very wrong. Yeah, I mean, it, with Porto Alegre, of course, it was there was a real mass spontaneous kind of attitude behind it. Now it's entirely like managerial the way it's deployed in, in, in countries like Scotland. And it is that thing of, We'll let the residents decide what to cut. You know, what I mean, so the whole logic of it is a bit like that Sophie's Choice, you know, but not quite as extreme. Um, but it is like that thing of like, which of your children, you know, what I mean, are you going to save? That's freedom. 
okay? Because really, because you're the one who decides at the end of the um, I haven't been ranting about is this cap over the M8. What's that? Uh, so, as part of the green planning, um, the city council want to basically put a cap, like a physical um, cap <laughs> lit, basically. <laughs> Imagine the M8 motorway as like a disgusting petri dish of fumes and cars and noise. What Glasgow City Council are planning on doing is basically just putting a fucking lid on the part of it, Charing Cross, and putting grass on top of that lid. Oh, I have seen this. That's so weird. Imagine sitting, would you ever sit on that park, right? A vibrating park, right? With like the stench of fumes all over the place. It's a crazy idea. I mean, I, th I think what annoys me about it is like that there's still no recognition of the legacy of what happens when urban planners are allowed free reign in a city and they're trying to like, you know, adapt for the future, but they're doing it as like urban planners and consultants where they, they I mean, to be an urban planner is basically to be driven by the philosophy of I mean I there are good people who do it and it's not a it's not a judgment but it's really about how can you ensure the labor supply are able to socially reproduce and still work in the city that's what I mean that's really what it's about like the concentration of people so that they can work and produce and there's a social reproduction element to that as well mm -hmm. um, but what, what's happened in terms of like the M8 is that, I mean, we, our city council in building the M8 built a wall through the whole city. Like it's a partition that, that carves up the whole of Glasgow. I mean, Charing Cross was once considered one of the um, most architecturally beautiful parts like of any city in Europe and city planners fucking bulldozed through it they removed thousands of people from their home dispersed them into different communities which had basically zero infrastructure nothing to do and um, like and we're still seeing the fallout of what happens when you know things aren't thought through in terms of uh, in, in actual like class terms. Do you know what I mean? It's all about like, let's make this look shiny, shiny new. Let's put Glasgow on the map. Like that's what the M8 was about. Um, that That's what putting a fucking bit of astroturf over the M8 is gonna be about. And um, nobody's actually thinking about like, well, what does this mean for people's jobs? for their quality of life, for the places that they live, how they identify as being a citizen of Glasgow. Like, and there's just no recognition of the disaster that the ME has been for the population of Glasgow. Nothing. There was huge resistance to that and it's basically been written out of history. There was huge protests and resistance groups to the building of that ME at the extent that it was. And it's kind of just been forgotten about. Mm, that's interesting because I, I didn't know that uh, that there was there was major resistance to that. Um, another thing, another uh, sort of development model which has come into crisis in Glasgow, and it follows the same logic of you know make it attractive to kind of like big bang investments is the building of student flats everywhere. And I saw people saying recently that some of these owners of these sort of tower blocks are now paying people to come and do uh, visits. Do you know what I mean? Uh, to come and have a look at, at the flats because they're struggling to fill them. That might, maybe that's conjunctural. Maybe that's because of the still controls on travel and, and, and maybe there's fewer foreign tourists and so on. But it'll be interesting to see. I mean, what we know about these forms of development is they always eventually exceed demand. Like the always they always overshoot eventually because you know people just want the, the, that greedy they just want a little bit more 
So we're going to end up with, you know, empty uh, sort of student flats all over the over the city. I dare say. Um, but yeah, uh, it's uh, it's it's looking a bit of a sorry place at the moment, uh, Glasgow. I think. Um, as I was saying, you know, all of this, all of this, this isn't, this isn't. Uh, you can't associate this from uh, the government either. Like the, the the largest like local authority in the country uh, in Glasgow, Susan Aitken wouldn't be doing this if she didn't have the go ahead from the, the Scottish government. Oh, yeah. Like, um, it's too important. It's too big. At least of you know, especially in this year with the the eyes of the world going to be on Glasgow for for COP twenty six. So it's uh, lots of questions here for the Greens as well. I I already think I know what's going to happen with this, which if it, if indeed, indeed there is an agreement, and if that agreement looks like this, which is what I kind of think it will look like, um, it won't be a formal coalition in the sense that the Greens won't be sort of the Green MSPs won't be sort of whipped to agree on every decision, every piece of legislation. They won't have to fall in line. They'll have a right to criticism. But there will be one or two Greens as in sort of ministerial positions. Now, I call that a coalition. Yeah. And I'm, I'm absolutely sure that the Scottish Greens are going to insist that this is not a coalition for the very simple reason that they want to be able to dissociate themselves from anything the government does. I, I look on if that is the, if that is the case, if that is where we're heading, I look on that for the very, I mean, I don't accept it. It's a coalition. If you're if you're going to provide left cover to the Scottish government, which I assume is why the Scottish government wants to reel them in, and if it's not even more cynical than that, if perhaps the Scottish government thinks long term the Greens could start to threaten us, let's uh, tarnish them with our brush now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be able to remind everyone when they criticise us at the next election that these people were in the government, right? And by the way. There's been something not too far short of a coalition for the last five years before now, which is that the Greens were relied upon to pass all the cuts budgets uh, year on year on year. Now, it's not a coalition, but it's functionally the same. So I'm not going to accept this thing of like, it's not a coalition. We are independent of the decisions made by the government. Then don't, you know, don't get, don't, don't join an agreement. Don't join a formal agreement with the government. Uh, so yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, that's what's going to happen but uh and it's i said it, i said a few days ago in a tweet <laughs> i said it i tweeted it right <laughs> the most banal form of public communication i just said i think the next few years in scottish politics are going to get really brutal and right? they're going to get really ugly because you can already see just a couple of months in after the election that there's basically no patience left at all for the SNP, right? Which is what I suspected. In fact, one of the funny things I think about that election is that the development of like ALBA, for example, actually helped the SNP leadership. Do you know what I mean? It created a kind of meaningful divide, at least in, in, in some quarters. But I saw there's an article in the Sunday Times saying that the SNP HQ is now receiving its highest volume of complaints from members ever. So the idea that, which is what I thought happened, that dissent against the leadership had collapsed in the party after Alba and, and so on, that doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, and there's a lot of just yeah, exhaustion with the, the direction of the Scottish government and so on. So I think it's going to be rough, and I think it could seriously hurt the Scottish Greens if they go along with it, which is why they're going to plead that they're not part of the government. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, there's also, like, some... There's not a good record of Green coalitions and what happens to the Green Party uh, when it's in coalition um, as, a, as, the, as the junior partner. Um, there's not a lot of uh, good signs for the Greens being in power. So I guess we'll have to see how that all plays out. Yeah, so obviously a few of those examples include Germany, Ireland. Yep. Um, I mean, the, the, obviously in the Scottish Greens, there's a degree of knowledge about that. And I've heard it said by leading Green figures that they are not like these other parties, including that they're not like their, their English sister party. Um, 
And I know, for example, that Ross Greer has been very critical of the Irish Greens. But he's also, I think, been one of the most enthusiastic for arriving at some kind of coalition agreement. So we'll need to see how that how that pans out. You know, ultimately, in these sorts of situations, criticising it when it's in another country is very different to the compromises that are foisted upon you once you enter into a power sharing agreement. And the only way you can res resolve that is at a communications level, right? If you're going to be in the government effectively, or even in the position that the Greens have been in the last five years, where the government couldn't have functioned without the Greens, you are going to have to sacrifice all your principles. You can only resolve that situation at the level of rhetoric, where you say, no, we didn't, we didn't just pass the, the cuts budgets. We, you know, the Greens always spin this as like, we saved X hundred million from cuts to blah, blah not telling you that they voted for, to do that, they voted for a much higher volume of cuts, right? Um, so they're going to try and resolve this contradiction at a level of rhetoric by first of all saying that they're not in a coalition. If indeed this all goes ahead, I mean, I don't know what the stumbling blocks are. If it does go ahead, they're going to resolve it first by saying, we're not in a coalition, this has got nothing to do with us, etc. They'll probably make a few stunts about, you know, trying to insist upon the Scottish government, say, not opening up this new oil exploration site uh, and and so on. Um, but it's not going to be the reality of the situation, yeah. which is dependence on the Greens to, um, to, to make government uh, function. I think that's what should be remembered. I mean, I'm going to... Uh, I mean, I watch it with good faith, do you know what I mean? But also the, the evidence of what has... It's not a criticism like in a personal sense, and it's not sectarian politics to say that in parties where you don't have accountability to like a mass organized movement, like you, the, the drift into centrism, into neoliberalism is very hard to resist. Like, and we see that all the time in coalitions with the Greens. Um, so I will watch it with good faith and, you know, wait and see what happens. But there's a lot of evidence out there to say it might not work out for the best. Um, here, I've got a goal. All right. Sorry, I didn't realise the time, but like me and James have tickets um, for a puppet show. Reactionary art. It's a puppet show. It's at the Sharmanka Kinetic Theatre in mm. the Trongate, um, where there's like this huge collection of kinetic puppets from. So how, uh, how did you just? How did you just pronounce theatre? I don't know. You theater? say theatre. Theatre. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So a reactionary puppet show. Um, I don't know if it's reactionary. It's called the Wheel of Life. Um, so I'll, I'll do a whole review for you. Okay. Um, best, the puppets were made in St. Petersburg and some in Scotland. And I've always wanted to go and we have tickets for it. And the show starts at six. So okay. I need to go. We'll, we'll have to, we'll have to discuss. I think our uh, chat about reactionary art derailed us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We want to discuss coalitions. We want to discuss Afghanistan. Um, we want to discuss... What else? I know that was it. Afghanistan, Afghanistan can wait. We'll we'll return to that. <laughs> I can wait. That's the that's the line. Well, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's only going in one direction. So, like, uh, yeah, we'll discuss that in, in the future. Okay. Um. Well, I'm just gonna stop recording now. Bye.